OK, guys, we might get started. So thank you for joining us this morning. Welcome to our Ocean Superhero session today. My name is Jenny and I'm Education Manager for the Marine Conservation Society. If you don't know of us and you haven't heard of us before, we are a UK charity working for the future health of our ocean. So we connect people and science. So we're really, really fortunate today that we've actually got one of our scientists joining us to help us with our Q&A, Dr. Jean-Luc Saland, and he will be answering any questions. I'll explain how that's going to work in a moment. We've also got um, Mary who will be manning our chat box today. So just before we get started, the way things will work, you will be able to put any questions that you have. You should have a little toolbar and a Q&A section. And then if you have any questions, you can go into there while we're working and you can put your question in there. And then at the end, um, Jean-Luc will uh, work our way. We'll work our way through as many of the questions as we can. If we get lots and lots, we might not have time for all of them, but we will do our best to answer those. Um, you can also talk to us via the chat box. Now, if you put anything in the chat box, if you have anything that you want to let us know, I'll be asking questions, so you'll be able to answer those in the chat box. The only people that will be able to see your chat, though, is myself and my colleagues today. So Jean-Luc and Mary will also be able to see what you put in the chat. You won't be able to see what each other are saying. So that's quite important that you know that. Um, if you would like to test that chat box out, would you jump into that chat box for me and just tell me where it is that you are coming from today? So where are you today? Your nearest town or maybe the county? Or even if you're not in the UK, you can tell us where you are coming from, because I know we might have people from all over the place. You can see already that we've got a couple of people from Cardiff. We've got a year five class from, oh, that went so quickly. Year five class from Weymouth. Welcome, year five. Lots of people from Cardiff, Birchgrove. Hello, Birchgrove. Love to have you joining us. Wales, Scottish Borders, Paynton, Herefordshire. Ah, oh, I can see. Hey, Jules. Um, lots of people in from Cardiff, Birchgrove. Fabulous. Guys, it's great to have so many people from all over the place. Year four, Birchgrove. Welcome, guys. It's fab to have you with us. So as I said, you can go into the Q&A to ask questions. If you're answering a question like you just did then when you were telling me where you're from, you can do that in the chat box. I'll remind you of this as we go along. But there's also a follow up that you can take part in. So there's an activity that you can do to follow up. I'm going to put that in the chat box at the moment so you can see where you will need to go to. So it's at bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash ocean super, you can probably hear me typing this, superheroes. There we go. So if you have a look in the chat box at the moment, that's the link that you'll need after the session to do the follow up activity. So it will stay in the chat box and we'll let you know that again later on as well. But if you copy on, copy that um, link, then you can put that in your browser window and you'll have that straight away afterwards. OK, other things that I need to let you know, I think that's just about everything that I need to tell you about for today. There's also one more function where you can raise your hand. Um, and what we'll be doing later on is we will be, well, you'll be voting for our ocean superhero. So I'll get you to do that by raising your hand and then I can count up and see what your answers are. It will all make sense and I will remind you of all of this. But I think it's time for us to get started. So let's meet some of our ocean superheroes today. OK, our first ocean superhero. Can you see an ocean superhero in that picture? Have a really, really good look. What can you see in that picture that you think might be the ocean superhero? If you have an idea, you can go into the chat box and you can give me your answer. What can you see? Oh, I can see somebody saying seagrass. Lots of people saying seagrass. It certainly is. It's the leaves. It is the seagrass in our image here. And if I just show you, here we go. So seagrass is a flowering plant. It likes to grow in coastal areas, so near to the land. And it likes to grow in sheltered areas. It doesn't like it if it's too kind of, um, what's the right word? If, the, if it's too rough in the waves, that's the right word for it. It likes it to be a bit more sheltered. Now, in this picture that I just showed you here, you can see a beautiful snake locks an enemy there, and that's just holding on to the um, to the seagrass in this picture. It's a really, really important habitat. It gives us, like other plants, it gives us oxygen, which is really, really important, um, just like the plants on the land do, and just like our seaweed does as well. So that's our ocean superhero number one, our seagrass. 
a look at Ocean's superhero number two. Have a look at this picture. What can you see? Can you see the ocean superhero in this image? I wonder. You can go in the chat box. I can see some people already have. Well done, guys. You're getting the idea already. We've got some people saying crab. There is definitely a crab. Crab thingy. It's definitely a crab in the middle. But actually, the ocean superhero that we're talking about isn't the crab in the middle. That's an edible crab. That means it's a really, really tasty crab to eat. You can also see a couple of other things. Oh, somebody has got this spot on and said it's Merle. We've got a few other things in this picture, and we'll talk about Merle in just a moment. If you have a look, you've got the crab in the centre. But all the way around the top here, you can see brittle sea stars. They're kind of starfish. I can see people are saying starfish. Well done. And there is also... Um, a sea squirt down here at the bottom, but people have correctly, well done, said it's the mill. And if we have a little look, let me just move some of my boxes. You see all this pink stuff? That's the mill. And mill is really, really super, super special, really. It is a kind of seaweed. So a bit different to our seagrass. It's not a plant, it's a kind of seaweed, which is an algae. <clears throat> and it is quite a special word because if you have a look, it's got a silent A in it. So it's merle, even though it looks like it might be marl. Just like seagrass, our mill gives us oxygen. It's really, really important because it gives us oxygen, but it's super, super awesome as well. It's a really calcified. Now, calcified is a bit of a complicated um, word. And if I stop my share for a second, I should be able to show you close. And I've got a tiny piece of sea of seagrass of merle here in my hand and it's gone white because it's out of the water now and it's no longer alive but when I say calcified let me show you what I mean if I'm quiet for a second you hear that it's gone a little bit like stone and it's super super brittle now because it's gone like stone it means it's very very fragile and it means that it can become damaged really easily. So some people were saying it looks a bit like a coral reef. You're absolutely right. It does look a little bit like a coral reef. And it's just as important and just as special to us. It actually grows really, really slowly. So less than a millimetre a year. So far, far less than you guys would be growing at your ages. Um, and the current sea... Uh, uh, keep saying seagrass instead, I need to get my mind in place. The current mill beds that we have, that we can see formed about 5,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago, and it's incredibly fragile. So it's fragile, grows slowly, and is super, super old. It's really, really important to us. Let's have a look at our third superhero. I'm just gonna put my mill down really, really carefully so I don't damage it. What is our third superhero? No, last but not least, have a little look. You can drop into the chat box again and tell me where is our ocean superhero in this picture? What can you see? You can see fish, some people are saying leaves or fish. Lots of people saying the fish in the middle. The fish in the middle is a ras. And actually, we can tell. I was um, talking to it was Jean Luc. I was talking to about this actually. Um, we can tell that this fish is excited because it's got this stripe down the side, and usually it doesn't have that stripe. So we can tell that maybe it's feeling defensive and protecting its land, or maybe it's seen uh, a girl fish or a boy fish that it likes the look of. Somehow that fish is feeling something, so it doesn't normally have that stripe. So when it gets emotional, it gets a stripe down the side. Now lots of people have said the fish, and the fish is really, really important but it's not the superhero habitat we're talking about it is this amazing seaweed which some people have said correctly is kelp and it is it's and someone's actually said it's like a sea tree you're absolutely right it does look a bit like a sea tree and that leads us really really nicely actually onto this next image it is our kelp Ooh. I thought I was going to have a big picture of it it's going to come later the forest picture is going to come later so just like Merle um Kelp is a seaweed and it has certain kind of parts to it. Let's have a little look at the difference between our seaweed and our seagrass, for example. Now, remember, our seaweed is a kind of algae. It has a hold fast at the bottom. So instead of a root, it holds onto something. So that's a compound word, isn't it? Anyone that's doing compound words or has done them at school, it's got two parts, which means that it holds tight or holds fast onto that rock. It has a stipe, that's like the main kind of stem that leads it, holds it up, and then it has blades instead of leaves. 
when we look at our seagrass, remember our seagrass is a plant and it's super, super important and super special. Our seagrass has a root, just like plants do on the land, but it also can reproduce through these rhizomes. Now, that, what that means is it just puts out like a horizontal root almost, and then it can grow another plant up from there. So it can grow along underneath the ground and then grow up, or to reproduce, our seagrass can produce flowers and then they produce the seeds. And as the seeds um, disperse, then that, uh, that is its reproduction system. So it's got two ways. Our seagrass has two ways that it can reproduce, which is really, really clever for a plant because it means that um, it's, it's just easier for it to reproduce, basically. So it's going to be more effective at doing it. Um, but they look very, very similar. And it's really, really easy to confuse our seaweeds and our seagrasses. But they are different. So they both give us oxygen and in some places kelp can grow to be super super big which is the next picture that I'm going to show you um really really huge giant giant kelp and it does look like a sea forest basically you're absolutely right now if I show you here we go this is the picture I thought I was going to be showing you a minute ago if you see here you can see a kelp forest under the water on the right hand side and then on the left you can see a picture of a tropical forest and they do look very very similar so well done to the person that said it was like a sea trees they absolutely are and they can be super super big now if you remember I said that you would be able to raise your hand as well to give me some answers now what I want to do is have a think about how important there are certain qualities that our ocean superheroes have. So whether we're talking about seagrass or kelp or merle, there are certain things that these habitats, these really, really important habitats do for us. And I want you to think about how important they are. So if we're thinking about how these superhero habitats give us oxygen to breathe. Now, if you can do this with me as well, you take a deep breath and then breathe out. And then take one more deep breath and then breathe out. And that, that second deep breath of oxygen that we took, that oxygen came from the sea, our sea and our ocean. And the plants and the creatures within our ocean give us the air that we breathe. So whether that's um, phytoplankton or whether it's the plants and the seaweeds, <clears throat> they help us to breathe. Now, if you think that is an important um, a, an important superhero um, power, then you can raise your hand. And if I have a little look, I'll be able to see who's raising their hands. So put your hand up if you think giving us oxygen to breathe is important. Who agrees with me and thinks, mm, yeah, I think so. Oh, I can see hands going, firing up, 26, 27 of you, 28 of you. Brilliant. Yeah, absolutely. It is kind of important. I know that I like to be able to breathe, that's for sure. So I'm thinking that you probably feel the same. Brilliant. Well done, guys. OK, I think you can... Take your hands down. I'm not sure there should be a way of me doing it, but I can't work it out now. Um, I will let you do that yourself. We'll, we'll do that for each of the, of the superpowers that we're talking about today. Now, these are super, super important to us because, like I said, they give us a lot of the oxygen that we breathe. In fact, they give us about 70% of the oxygen that we breathe on land. Now, we know about how good um forests, how good trees and how good plants and land are at giving us oxygen. But sometimes people don't know so much about the, um, the plants and the algae in the sea. So it's really, really important that we're learning about that. Now, these are superhero habitats and they're super exciting to us because we get these all the way around the UK. Now, I'm pretty sure that no one said that they were coming from outside the UK today. But if you're not in the UK, so you're not um, close to us, let me know in the chat box and let me know where you are coming from, because these habitats exist all around the world as well. They're, they're found in different places. It's not just in the UK that you can find these. If you have a look, these maps that I'm going to share with you or that I'm sharing with you now show us where we have recorded sightings. Now, what that means is that somebody has gone, they maybe have gone diving or maybe they've gone snorkeling in the water and they have said, yep, yeah, we've seen seagrass there. And then they have reported that to us. Now, that doesn't mean that there isn't seagrass sea in other places as well. It just means that this is where we have confirmed sightings. So scientists have seen them or maybe citizen scientists, people that go diving and then work with us to tell us about them. So you can see seagrass there is found in lots and lots of areas around the UK. Now, if you've got an adult with you or even if you're super good at map reading, you can have a look at that map and see where you are and where your nearest seagrass bed would be. Now, seagrass grows into 
into big beds or what we call meadows under the sea. So much like the kelp growing into a forest, we would have seagrass meadows in lots of these places now. But it's not just seagrass we're talking about today. We are also talking about mill. Now, if you have a look, mill is, as we said, didn't we? It's more fragile. It grows very, very slowly. And if you have a look, far, far less places that we're going to find mill. So it's very, very um, important that we protect our mill. And um, we've got one more superhero that we've talked about, and that is our kelp. And this last map shows you where you will find kelp in the UK as well. So have a little look at those maps, see if you can spot your nearest ocean superhero to where you are. We can see, oh, someone saying seven estuary seagrass. I really want to go there and see it. Yeah, absolutely. I would quite like to see that as well. I haven't been able to, I don't live near the sea, guys. I'm really, really unfortunate that I'm not near the sea. So I haven't been to the sea for lots of places. Um, no, someone saying lots that Merle isn't found in lots of places. That's very, very true. It isn't found as frequently. We don't get so much of it. It's very, very slow growing, remember. <clears throat> now, if you're not in the UK, I don't think anyone is, but if you're not, do have a look and see where your nearest ocean superheroes are. It's quite cool to know where they are. So what else makes these guys superheroes? Why am I calling them superheroes? What is it about them? Well, one really, really important thing, and we've mentioned this briefly, is that they provide habitat for lots and lots of creatures, particularly our young creatures, a bit like a nursery, if you like, <clears throat> excuse me, because it's a bit more protected and sheltered. So we call the range of animals that we have in an area, you may already know this, but we call it biodiversity. And that's just the different types of animals that we have in the area and the spread and the range of different creatures. Now, when we see an area that has good biodiversity, we know that that habitat is really healthy. So it's a really, really good sign. And our seagrass meadows particularly are super at providing lots of biodiversity and having um, uh, providing a home for lots and lots of different creatures. So we have a couple of awesome creatures to show you now. First one, you can see a peacock. Hmm. That's a bit strange, isn't it? I'm pretty sure we don't get peacocks under the water. So why have we got a peacock? Well, because you do get these beautiful peacock worms, aren't they absolutely stunning? And you can see why they're peacock worms, because they've got these beautiful, a bit like the tail feathers of a peacock, and they splay out, aren't they beautiful? And lots of different colours, they're brightly coloured in comparison to what I really thought they might be. So that's another reason that they'd be described as a peacock worm. So what else can we see? We can see jellyfish stalked jellyfish aren't they beautiful and these would you can see a seagrass um, a blade of seagrass there and you can see the um the stalked jellyfish kind of nestling in amongst it what else do we have cuttlefish these are beautiful if you haven't seen a cuttlefish changing color have a little look online because they're absolutely amazing and there's their eggs again hanging on to some seagrass whoops and there's a little baby cuttlefish. Now, remember I said that it was a good sheltered area as a nursery area, so you'd have the eggs, which obviously would hatch into the babies, and then eventually they become the adult cuttlefish. See lots of plankton in this picture. Now, they're super, super important because they're the base of our food chain in the ocean. If you've done food chains and food webs at school, then you will know how that all works. They're really, really important. And we've also got a seahorse. Now we have two, spe two species, I can't say that properly today, two species of seagrass, oh, see, seahorse even, goodness me, try again. Um, in the UK, we have the long-snouted seahorse and, and short-snouted seahorse. Now, to tell the difference, you need to look at how long their noses are. And the one in the picture here is a short-snouted seahorse. Whew. Try saying that one really, really quickly. So guys, what we're gonna do now, isn't that beautiful, that seahorse? And you can see the blade of seagrass just next to it. Now, we are gonna have a think about biodiversity. So remember when you, you voted for me a few minutes ago, you voted for whether or not oxygen was super important. Do you think that our superhero power of providing good biodiversity, does that make our superheroes superheroes? Is it really, really important? Put your hand up if you think that is super important and providing a home a habitat for all of these creatures is important. See lots of people raising their hands. Fab guys, 
Well done. That's brilliant. And I can also see a few people have dropped into chat box. I'm just going to have a little look. Lots of people saying they are in the UK. Fabulous. We did have a babe with cuttlefish. They are beautiful. Someone said that the seahorse is adorable. I love that. Yeah, I agree. They are really special, special creatures, aren't they? So lots of you agreeing. Hands are up. Well done, guys. You can take your hands down if you are ready. Well done. Now, our next our next superhero power is it's a little bit compl complicated. So you may have done this at school, and if you haven't yet, then you probably will be doing when you get to maybe year five or year six. Um, and here we're talking about how plants get their energy, basically. Now, if we want to, um, we know that our superheroes, they give us the oxygen that we breathe, right? We know that they're giving us our oxygen, just like the plants on the land do. Now, but to do that, they take in carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide, as you probably know, is the gas that we make as humans when we do pretty much anything. So if we drive our car, if we heat our houses, it, even right now I'm using a light, so that's using energy, which will have made carbon dioxide in the process. It's really, really complicated. I'm trying to make it as simple as possible. But we know that that gas that we produce, carbon dioxide, is the one that's making our world warmer. OK, so if you are a teacher, if you're a parent, we have a lesson on our YouTube channel if you want to do a bit more about climate change. Now, when they take in our carbon dioxide and they give us our oxygen, they're doing two really, really useful things because they are giving us the air that we need to breathe of air that we need to fill our lungs to be healthy, but they're also taking that dangerous carbon dioxide out of our atmosphere and they are locking it away and they lock it in down through their roots and they take it out of the atmosphere and they take it out down through and out of the sea. And that's really, really important for us because that can help us in our fight against climate change. And we know that we have to stop our world from getting warmer. So this is a really, really, it's complicated, but it's a really, really important process. Some of you might know what that process is called. It's called photosynthesis. And it's how plants get their energy. Now, our seagrasses do the same thing. Uh, sorry, our seaweeds do the same thing. They're taking carbon dioxide out as well. Now, our um, seagrass sea is super, super good at doing this. In fact, it's 35 times better at taking our carbon um, and taking it away from our atmosphere than rainforests are. And we know, we talk a lot about how good rainforests are or forests in our country even, but people often don't know about how super good seagrass is as well. It's a really, really important um, feature. And they take, they literally are taking the carbon dioxide out. So our superheroes are actually saving the world. By removing the carbon dioxide that causes climate change, they're helping to save the world. Now, do you think that is important? Raise your hand if you think that is a really important superhero power. Is it important to us? Somebody said here in the chat box that they're a bit like trees. Yeah, absolutely. It does, it works the same way. But actually, seagrass is even better than the trees, but just lots of people don't know it. Lots of people have raised their hand. You're agreeing. You think that taking away our carbon is really, really important. Well done, guys. And there's something else that they do that is really, really important as well. They, this again is a bit complicated. If you have a look at this picture that I'm sharing with you at the moment, have a little think you can answer in the chat box. What do you think has caused, you can see that there was a road here. What do you think has caused the road? It looks like a kind of a monster has come along and bitten chunks of the road out. It's not a monster, is it? We know it's not a monster. What is, what, what's caused that? What has caused the road to disappear? You see somebody saying erosion. Someone saying the flood, the waves, the sea. You're absolutely right. It is. It's the waves, the ocean. When the when the ocean comes in, it's really, really powerful. And it's over time, it's hit the road and it's done what somebody rightly said is called erosion. It's just the wearing away. If you think about when you're using a rubber and you want to rub out some pencil and a bit of the rubber rubs off, doesn't it? And you get like that little, it's erosion. It's where it's worn away. And over time, this has taken away the road in this, this in this picture, but in other pictures that you'll find if you have a look online, you'll be able to see them. They maybe have eaten away and there's houses that are at risk of falling off the edge of the land and into the sea. And it's because of the power of the waves. Now, our ocean superheroes do something really, really important. What they do is they are underneath the sea coast, close to our coast, and particularly for kelp 
and seagrass, it slows the wave down. And because the wave's a bit slower, it's not as strong when it hits the land. So it hits the land and it doesn't cause as much damage. So our ocean superheroes, mill isn't as good because mill is very, very low. If you remember the pictures, it's very, very little. So it's not going to it's not going to slow the waves down quite as much. But kelp and seagrass particularly are very, very good at doing this. They help to protect our land. And in other areas around the world, things like coral reefs and mangroves, they do the same thing. They slow down the waves as it's getting, as the waves are getting in towards the coast. So it actually helps to stop the, the land from getting worn away, it protects our land for it. Now, if you think that is really, really important, pop your hand up, let me know that you think that's important. Um, and I'm just going to see lots of people are talking about it in the chat. So the sea has crashed into the road. Yes, you're absolutely right. I can see lots of people saying it's the waves. Rocks, are, the, wood, the waves can even pick up some of the rocks from the seabed and they could even throw it at the land as well. Um, someone's saying their dad was a marine biologist. Wow, amazing. Now, so they're really, really important. How many people we've got? Lots of people have raised their hands. <coughs> Excuse me. Well done, guys. So that's protecting our land from erosion. So we're just going to do, before we move on to the next part, we're just going to do a quick recap. Now, there were four things, if we remember, four superhero powers that made our ocean superhero habitats so important. Let's see if we can kind of recap before we move on what these were. So have a put your thinking caps on, have a little bit of a think. Can you, in your head, can you name those four things? Hmm, let's see. While you're having a little think, I'm just going to catch up with the chat. It's a place called Clapton, I think. I think it probably is. How does the sea do that damage? The sea does the damage because it's super, super powerful. The ocean is a really, really powerful thing. And just because of the, the power, the push of the waves hitting the land, then it would just take a little bit of a way. It happens in some areas more than in other areas. It depends on the shape of the coast. It depends on the shape of the seabed. But our ocean superheroes can help. Okay, I think you've probably had enough thinking time. So let's recap those four superhero powers. One of them was, my screen will move on, there we go, they give us oxygen that we use to breathe, really really important right, we all like to breathe, they help to reduce climate change, remember we talked about the process of photosynthesis where, they, where plants and algae will take carbon, um, carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, they help to improve biodiversity, they provide a habitat and a home for loads and loads of different species, lots of different creatures. And the last one that we just looked at was, was that they help to prevent erosion. They do, they do loads and they do more important things for us. Those are the top four important things that these habitats do for us. So let's have a, just a quick thing about why we need to protect these, um, these habitats, these ocean superheroes, and what sorts of things might cause a problem for them. And we're not going to talk about this too long. We're going to think about how you can be an ocean superhero and some of the things you can do to help our ocean superheroes. So let's have a little think about what these are. Now, one of the first one is construction. So if we build, if we build on the coast, especially if we're building new ports, now we might need to have new ports where the big, big boats from overseas come in, maybe if they're bringing things like fridges or cars, anything big that you have in your home probably has come from across the sea and it's come in one of those big container, um, uh, container ships and they need really, really deep water. So maybe they need to have the port needs to be dug out and cleared, or maybe it's just building along the coastline. Any kind of construction that affects and changes the coastline, particularly if we're having to clear areas of the seabed, if we clear the seabed, then our ocean superheroes aren't there. And just a sandy seabed, as important as sandy seabeds are, they don't have the biodiversity that we have in areas where we have our ocean superheroes. They don't have as many creatures living there because our ocean superheroes aren't there. So they can't provide this nice nursery area habitat. 
So that's one thing that can cause problems is construction. When you stir up the water as well, you get like a silt. Now that's a mix of sand and mud from the seabed. And if that settles on our ocean superheroes, if it sits on it, or it sits on them, then it means that they can't photosynthesize. They can't get their energy as well. So they're not going to be as healthy. Now, we said that the ocean superheroes are really helpful to us because they help us with climate change but they are also affected by climate change because as our ocean gets warmer and our sea levels get higher, then it makes it harder for the light to reach our superheroes on the bottom of the ocean. And then again, they can't photosynthesize as well. Now, if they can't photosynthesize as well, then what happens is they, they can't get their food. So it's a bit like if we couldn't eat as well, basically, they can't get their energy and they're not gonna be as healthy. And our last one is what, what else can damage? Well, boat moorings and anchors can cause damage as well. And I've actually got a picture that I'll show you because a picture is so much better than me using words. If you have a look at this photograph now, you can see around the edge, well, you can see these lighter coloured, can't you? Lighter coloured patches in the seabed. Now, this whole area is a seagrass meadow. And around each of these boats, you can see, have a little think. I wonder if you can think what's causing those lighter patches. What do you think that might be that's causing those? I can see someone saying anchors. So it is. Now, if you think about it, in these beautiful areas where we get our ocean superheroes, it's a lovely place to go with your boat as well. And each one of these lighter patches is where there is, has been a boat moored. Now, some of them have got a boat on the chain. Now, the way a mooring works is they'll have a big block under the ground, under the under the seabed even, um, on the seabed, and then they'll have a chain. And that chain will go up to the boat. It stops the boat from floating away. You don't want to go for a swim off your boat or go for a snorkel or take a little boat off your bigger boat and your boat disappears. So you have to attach it. Now, if it's anchored, that chain has to have it has to be a little bit loose because the boat has to be able to move around a little bit so it doesn't break. And when that boat moves around a little bit, if you imagine it swirling around with the wind or the waves, the tide, what happens is it spins around on its anchor point. Now that could be an anchor that's just in the bottom of the seabed or it might be the mooring and it spins around and it when it does that, it rubs away, it erodes, same as we were talking about the waves causing erosion, it erodes the seagrass. So all these light patches are where the seagrass isn't anymore. Those are bare sandy beds because the seagrass has been rubbed away by the chain. Now, there is an answer to this. Let's have a look at the answer to this. The answer is part, or one of the answers is part of a project that the Marine Conservation Society are involved in. And um, Jean-Luc is working on this project um, as our scientist. Now this project looks on, looks at some particularly important areas. The project is called the Life Remedies Project. And we're working with various different partners. And it's, this is along the south coast of England. We are monitoring the seagrass beds. We're replanting new seagrass beds. So we'll take seeds, we'll grow them in a lab and then replant those seagrass plants, but also making sure that we install moorings that won't cause as much damage. So these moorings have the same sort of idea. They have a chain. They have a spiral, a bit like a corkscrew that goes into the ground. And then the chain, instead of just being loose on the ground, it has buoys, you know, air filled buoys all the way up to hold it off the seabed. And just lifting it up means that it won't rub. Um, and we are focusing on these areas. If anybody out there is in these areas today and you want your school to be involved, then get in touch, drop us an email at education at mcsuk.org um, and let us know that you're interested in getting involved and we can tell you more about it. But so far it is looking really, really good. Um, now today is a special, special day. It's World Seagrass Day today. And if you are interested, you can have a look on our um, Facebook channel because we are actually doing a live later on today where one, another one of our scientists will be doing a live from a seagrass bed along the south coast. So have a look at our um, Facebook channel. I think that's about 12 o'clock that's happening. So if you're interested, check that out. And that's our, our celebration of World Seagrass Day today. So let's have a little look. If you're near there, then do check the areas out. But we also have a superhero challenge for all of you. Now, no matter where you are, you can help us because if you remember Several times I've mentioned that lots of people don't know about these things, about these amazing habitats and these um, 
these uh, creatures within it. So you do now, you know about these. So what we want for you to do and what we need for you to do is to help us to spread the word. Now there's a couple of different ways and there are the follow-up activities, the one that I put in the chat box, that's at bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y. Um, forward slash ocean, ocean superheroes will help you to do this. So we want you to tell as many people as you can about our superheroes and why they're important. Now, I've come up with some ideas. You don't have to stick to these ideas at all. These are just some starters to give you some thoughts. So you might make a leaflet. There's a fact sheet with the follow up activities that covers most of the information that we've talked about today. So you could make a leaflet. You could maybe make a TV broadcast. You could do it like a TV news report or maybe an information report, or maybe even a web page, or maybe you've got a way better way that you would like to share information about our ocean superheroes so that everybody knows why they're important and how they can look after them. Ooh. And don't forget to share your work with us at MCS UK. And you can use, if you are able to go and get these posted online using social media, you can use the hashtag Save our seas, or you can indeed email us. There'll be an email goes out to you after this um, this session, so you can email us back with your um, your work. We'd love to see what you've done. We'd love for you to share your work with us. So let us know if you do do things. I'm just going to drop down into our chat. Ah, oh, Mary's put the brilliant. I can see that Mary's put those the link back into the chat box as well. So fabulous. Thank you, Mary. So there's heaps of different things you can do. Let us know, spread the word, tell the world about this. Make sure that you are talking to an adult about how you spread the word, of course, whether that's your teacher or your parent. But how could you be an ocean superhero? Now, just before I, um, I talk about how you can be an ocean superhero, what I would like for you to do, I'm gonna launch a poll on the screen. Now, there's just a few questions for you, and then we'll look at how you can be an ocean hero, and then it will be, about going into the Q&A and we'll see some of the questions that you've got and we'll try and answer a few of those before we finish up. So I'm gonna launch this poll. On your screen, you will see a series of questions. Most of them are yes, no answers. Um, if you could start to fill that in, it's just asking you what you thought about today's session, whether you learned something new, whether you're gonna do a follow-up activity and whether you'd like to join another webinar. So if you can answer those questions, that would be fab. I'll leave that open for a few minutes. There will any adults listening, there will also be a survey that should come up at the end of the session. And we would love to have your feedback as well. It's really, really useful for us to try and help make the session better for next time, but also to provide um, evidence for our funders as well. So it'd be much appreciated if you could fill that in. So while you're giving us some feedback there, guys, let's think about how you could be an ocean superhero. So you could tell the world about them. That would be really, really useful. But what else could you do? Well, this is super, super important. One thing that we can all do is make sure we turn off our electrical things, our electrical items when they're not being used. So instead of leaving them switch on standby, so the switch is still, the plug socket is still on, and maybe you've got a little red light, you can actually turn that off at the plug socket and that uses a little bit of less electricity. And if you do that on lots of things, like always unplugging your mobile phone charger, if you've got one, that makes a difference overall. So a little bit of energy saved in lots of places makes a difference. And there's one more idea. So there's just two ideas of things you can do to be an ocean superhero in your home. Now, make sure that when you recycle things that you clean it really, really well so that it doesn't mess up the recycling load, but also that it goes in the right bin. That is really, really important. Put it into the right recycling box. Now, I can't tell you what those rules are because where you live is probably different to where I live. The rules are all different and it's a little bit complicated, but it would be really, really good if you could be like the recycling monitor in your homes and make sure that people are putting those things into the right place. That makes a big difference and it stops the load of recycling from being thrown away. If we get contaminated, if it goes in the wrong place or it's dirty, then that whole load will be thrown away. Okay, I can see most people have answered our poll. Thank you very much, guys. I just have one last thing to share with you and then we will move on to our Q&A. So if you haven't had a chance already, have a look at our Courses Explorer Centre at www.mcsuk.org forward slash cool seas, lots of games and activities and things you can do on there, especially if you're home learning at the moment. Um, there's lots and lots you can do. And if you are a school, there's lots and lots of different learning 
outlines, lesson plans up there as well. Guys, I'm going to end that poll now. And I think it's time for us to drop into our Q&A box. Thank you for answering the poll, guys. And let's have a little look at our Q&A. So, JL and Mary, do you want to flick your cameras on and join us? So we can see you. Da, da, da. They are here, really, guys. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Morning. So we have got lots and lots of questions here. Mm -hmm. I've done yeah. quite a lot of talking today. Mary, do you want to read some of the, choose some of the questions to read out? Sure. So the top question was eight upvotes. We've got how long can seagrass grow? Yeah, it's a really good question. It can grow for up to 200,000 years. <laughs> so um, um, some of the seagrass beds in the Mediterranean are really, really old. And what it is, is they just grow layer upon layer upon layer upon layer really very, very slowly. And it's not much different from the grass in your garden. If you keep cutting your grass and, you know, you move out of your house after 10 years, that grass still exists and it, the, the soil will accumulate on top of it as worms create soil and put more soil on top and the grass. So in a way, the same seagrass can grow for up to 200,000 years, would you believe? So incredible answer, but these, this, why, this is why we have to look after these places. And just to put a bit of info, it's not just seagrass that's really old. The merl beds that we have, as we call them, we call them beds of merl, this calcareous algae, as Jen said, it can grow up to 8,000 years old. So the marine environment has a lot of old things in it. They're not the exact same things, but they're the sisters. They're exactly the same genetic makeup, we call it. So incredible, isn't it? But there you are. Jen's, Jen's in shock, you can see. From her I, face. I, do you know, I am a bit in shock by how old that's, uh, how old, yeah. And I was just, I was actually just thinking, guys, it's really, really great that we have, because um, Jean-Luc is a scientist and it, that works on this. I'm not a scientist, I'm a, I'm a teacher. So it's really great that we've got somebody that knows all of this stuff with us. So if you've got more questions, don't forget to fire them in. Mary, do you want me to choose the next one? I got. I, I could see some great ones. There was one about. Oh, what do is, you want to pick? To, yeah, to sure. So the, there was one on chloroplast. What is a chloroplast? Well, a chloroplast is kind of like the energy atom inside every plant. It's not just in seagrass. It's what converts light with nutrients and carbon dioxide into energy, sugars. So all of the food we eat as humans turns into sugars, a kind of thing called a carbohydrate. You might have heard that. So it's the same in plants, but they need some nutrients. And the other th clever thing about seagrass is the chloroplasts and the whole blade behind Jenny's picture, you can see, most plants get the nutrients from the grounds in the roots on land. Now, seagrasses are super clever because they just get it through their blades. They can actually absorb it through what they call the cuticle. Um, so they're very clever. So the chloroplasts are the energy um, capsules of the of the of all plants, so really vital. And why are they green? Because of the chloroplasts. Chloroplasts are green. They And some plants are, are red and some plants are brown in the sea, but those are our seaweeds. And they're using different type of energy, largely related to depth. So you have the green plants in the shallow water, the brown plants a bit deeper, and the red plants from the surface all the way down to really quite deep parts of the ocean to about 50 to 100 meters. So, so the, the color of the chloroplasts and that it gives off will be related to the amount of energy of light that there is at different depths. But all sea grasses are, are green. Another cool question was about why do corals bleach? Because I also work on corals, I'm very lucky. But sadly, because of increased sea surface temperatures, um, we had a big coral bleaching event in the Great Barrier Reef from 2015 to 2017. And, and that caused a lot of the corals to go white, hence the term bleaching. Now, corals are really clever. They eat, in effect, tiny microscopic plant cells in, and put, they go through their tummy and they put them all around the effectively their skin, their outer layer. If they're, it's a big word. They're called zooxanthellae. It's <laughs> one word. You don't have to look it up. Um, so these tiny plants called zooxanthellae are distributed all around the coral's kind of outer skin. That's why they're colourful. And that 
plant material absorbs just like in seagrass with their chloroplasts in each of these tiny cells. It absorbs um, the light and then gives the coral, the food, the thing that the coral ate, it gives the coral food. It gives 80% of the energy to the coral. Now, when the THC temperature gets too hot, sadly, the coral gets uh, poisoned by the plant because there's a reaction that's really bad. Um, and they, they basically regurgitate or you, they kind of sick out those, those, um, those algal cells, zoo xantheli. So then they go white. So much of my work is to record where corals are managed to resist this process and then try to protect those areas where they're resistant to it because the corals are the houses to the fish. They're really important for climate change. And just like Jen said, for seagrass beds, the corals are really, they grow upright to the surface. So they block all the waves and they keep islands um, intact. So we need to look after our corals. We really need to look after our seagrass beds. We need to look after our kelp beds and our mole beds. These are old, old systems. They're not used to humans. They're not used to what we do to the sea. They haven't adapted to it. And uh, I think I think that was one. I mean, one more question, Jen. Is that all right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. There was one about plastic plastic eating by marine life. Now, a lot of marine life can't really see very well, and it can't distinguish between what looks like a tiny bit of food or a tiny bit of a microbead or a plastic or a fiber from a jumper or something like that that is in the ocean. So a lot of animals do eat sea uh, plastics uh, mistakenly. You've seen photos of turtles eating plastics, no doubt, because they think it looks like jellyfish or something like that, because it floats a bit like jellyfish. So it's also the same all the way down to much, 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 much smaller items of much, much, much smaller animals. So, so they will eat it. And there's various science that says it might, it might not be really bad for them. Probably it's not good because some plastics contain things called carcinogens, things that cause cancers. So obviously that isn't good. And then Sometimes we eat the animals that eat the animals that eat the animals that eat the plastic. So also we've got to be a bit careful because we're going to just not be doing ourselves many favours if we keep eating a lot of stuff from the sea, perhaps. I mean, there are mussels that filter seawater. I don't know if you've seen them in your supermarket. They're these two shelled things and they suck in water with these these valves and then they spit out the water they don't want. They, they can't tell whether something's got plastic in it or not. So we, a lot of animals, unfortunately, do eat plastic. I think that's most of your questions. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. That was really, really great. It's great to have the expert on, on, on um, standby to answer all of those questions. So, guys, I have seen that there are a few other questions, but I think we've hit probably the most important or the most connected ones that we've got today. And it is coming up. In fact, I think it's just a little bit over um, our end time. So I just wanted to remind you to go and access the um, follow up activities because there's some good stuff there, but make sure that you share with us what you've done as well, because it is so nice for us to be able to see and be able to share on our social media channels the things that you've done um, from today's session and the people that you've talked to or the people that you've shared information with. It's a bit harder at the moment, so you have to find some clever ways of spreading the word. Um, yeah, 200,000 years old. That is super, super old, older than even my dad is. Super, super, <laughs> super old. He won't mind me saying that. Um, uh, Jean-Luc, thank you so much for joining thank us you. this morning. Really appreciate it. Mary, thank you for being on guard with the chat. That's fantastic. Um, guys, have a fabulous day. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you are an adult, please, please do fill in the feedback um, afterwards. We'd really appreciate your opinions. And otherwise, thank you so much for joining us. Have a fantastic day. And we will see Happy you. Happy World Seagrass Day, everyone. Yeah, enjoy Seagrass Day, guys. Take care. Bye. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, everyone.